let's have a recall of what you have learned so far. All organs in the body are made up of uh, tissues that are linked together to form an organ. And there are four basic types of tissue. We have the epithelial tissue, which is composed of cells that are tightly packed together because they have numerous intercellular adhesions. So therefore, these cells won't have spaces for blood vessels. So therefore, the epithelial tissue is considered as avascular. Immediately below the epithelium, you have the topic for today, which is connective tissue. Uh, you have learned from the introduction to histology that the connective tissue provides blood supply to the epithelium. So even if the epithelium is avascular, the cells there will not die because they will have constant uh, source of blood supply or oxygen and nutrients. Okay, And that is because of the presence of the underlying connective tissue. The third tissue that we will learn okay, also in the succeeding topics is the muscle okay and take note what links the epithelium to the muscle is the connective tissue so that's the reason why it's called connective tissue because it tends to connect other type of tissues the last tissue that can make up an organ in the body is the nervous tissue as previously mentioned the connective tissue functions to provide nutrients and blood supply to the avascular epithelium it's also there to bind epithelium to the other tissues in the organ. Aside from these two functions, the connective tissue can also provide protection. How? We will discuss that later. So as you can see, the function of protection is not only limited up to the epithelial layer, it's also very true to the underlying connective tissue. And then some cells that make up the connective tissue can also contribute to immune responses. So these other two functions will be discussed thoroughly as we go with the lecture. The blue arrow is pointing to a group of cells that are tightly packed together. So most likely these cells are part of the epithelium. Below the epithelium, the area pointed by the yellow arrow, you can see in there that the cells have spaces between them. So they are not tightly packed. So most likely, the area pointed by the yellow arrow is the connective tissue. At the tip of the yellow arrow is a blood vessel. So that will prove to us that the connective tissue has blood vessels which can provide nutrients and oxygen to the avascular epithelium. Tissues are made up of group of cells with interrelated function. But you have learned already in the introduction to our subject that there is more to tissues than just group of cells because you have their extracellular matrix which is composed of fibers and ground substances. Since connective tissue is a tissue, expect to find the three components. We have the cells, we have the fibers, and the ground substances which make up the extracellular matrix. This is a good picture of a connective tissue. So let's try to identify the three components. We have here the cell. As you can see, this cell does not look like the other cells in the picture because you have already understood that the tissues need not to be composed of similar cells. It can be composed of different cells and as long as their functions are interrelated to each other, then they can make up a tissue. Aside from this cellular component, you also have the fiber and the ground substance. The fiber and the ground substance make up the extracellular matrix. This is how the connective tissue looks like under the microscope. So it's very important at this point that you should be able to identify the three main components. So let's start. This is the cell. This is the fiber and this is the ground substance at this point we will be discussing the different components of our connective tissue so let's start with the ground substance ground substance is the background material where the cells and the fibers of the connective tissue are embedded they may look like empty spaces but these ground substances are very important they are composed of chemicals that bind cells of the connective tissue together. They can also bind cells to the fibers and the fiber to another fiber. So that's how important ground substance is. 
So these are the different functions of the ground substance. Number one, it fills up the spaces that we can find between the cells and the fibers. And this ground substance functions to link the cells to the fibers, fibers to other fibers, and cells to other cells. So take a look at this picture. You have here the cell membrane of one of the cells of the connective tissue. And then this is one of the fibers. Can you appreciate the green colored structure that links the two? That is now the ground substance. So therefore, the ground substance links the cells and the fibers. The other functions of ground substance will be elaborated later. But let's just try to identify them. Ground substance provide venue for exchange of substances. It can also store water and it can provide barrier to infection. How? We will elaborate that on the succeeding slides. Shown here in this photo are two of our tissues. We have the epithelium and the underlying connective tissue. They are separated by the structure we know as the basement membrane. Take a look at the cells of the epithelium. They are tightly packed together because they have abundant intercellular adhesions. And that makes the epithelium avascular. And the epithelium will rely on the connective tissue for nutrients and supply of oxygen. So I want you to focus on the connective tissue. Please appreciate the structure that is labeled as blood vessel. So blood will flow through that blood vessel and the oxygen and nutrients will diffuse out of the blood vessel so that these nutrients and oxygen will be supplied to the cells of the epithelium and as well as the cells of the connective tissue. The area where the oxygen and the nutrients will diffuse into so that they can reach the cells of the epithelium and the cells of the connective tissue is the ground substance. That's why the ground substance, as mentioned in the previous PPT, can provide a venue for the exchange or diffusion of substances. Shown here in this picture is a capillary. And then surrounding the capillary is this group of cells. As you can see, water, glucose, and amino acids are diffusing out of the capillary and they are diffusing towards the cells. And the space where the water the glucose and the amino acids are flowing into so that they can reach the cell is the ground substance. On the other hand, the waste products and carbon dioxide are also diffusing away from the cell into the capillary via the ground substance. In the different joints in our body, bones articulate with each other. And for these bones not to crush each other, the distal end of one bone and the proximal end of the other bone should be covered with articular cartilage, the blue colored structure that you can find in the photo. So, I want you to take a look at the animation. I want you to appreciate that as the bones articulate against each other, they are creating compression forces against the cartilage. So, what is in the cartilage that enables it to withstand the compression brought about by the articulation? The answer is, the cartilage is rich in water. And what stores water in the cartilage is its ground substance. So, that's why the third function of the ground substance is to store water. So, I want you to imagine if the cartilage is compressed, the force generated by the compression will be distributed all throughout the size or the length of the cartilage because of the movement of the water that was stored by the ground substance. So that's why cartilage can withstand the compression forces generated by the articulation of the bones in the joints. So take a look at this picture. You have here a cartilage that is rich in water. So if this cartilage will be compressed, the water will just simply move and distribute the force generated by the compression. Another function of the ground substance is to create barrier to infection. This is the picture of the skin. As you can see on the left side of the screen, you have there a sharp object that has caused a break in the skin. So in this case, the stratified squamous keratinized epithelium cannot anymore perform its function, which is to provide protection. 
and there is subsequent introduction of microorganisms on the underlying connective tissue. These microorganisms can spread to other tissues in the skin and cause destruction. But what do you see on the right side of the screen? The microorganisms introduced into the underlying connective tissue were retained on the area where they were introduced. Why? Because you need to wait for the white blood cells to reach the site of infection and kill them. And do you know what caused the microorganisms to be retained or localized on the area where they were introduced? That's the function of the ground substance. But please do understand that there are microorganisms that can digest the ground substance. So, if the microorganism introduced into the underlying connective tissue can break down the ground substance, then expect that the infection will become deep-seated. This is just a superficial infection, so it means the ground substance was effective in creating the barrier to infection and not allowing the microorganism to spread into other tissues on the skin. But in this case, it's very obvious that the microorganism introduced into the skin could have enzymes that can digest the ground substance. But the thing is, it's very important to take note that the ground substance, aside from storing water, aside from uh, providing nutrients and oxygen to the cells of the epithelium, can also create barrier to infection. Now, what are the different components of the ground substances? They can be divided into two. We have polysaccharides or carbohydrates and we have proteins. In terms of the polysaccharides or carbohydrates, we have two types. We have glycosaminoglycans and we have proteoglycans. Let's have a review. Yellow arrow is pointing to one of the fibers in the connective tissue. Green arrow is pointing to the cell membrane of one of the cells of the connective tissue. And what is linking the fiber pointed by the yellow arrow to the cell membrane pointed by the green arrow is that green colored structure pointed by the red arrow. So that is most likely our ground substance. What I will do now is to show you a good schematic diagram of the ground substance. And we will try to look for the polysaccharide component or the carbohydrate components. What are those again? We have the glycosaminoglycans and we have the proteoglycans. This is a schematic diagram of our ground substance. Let's identify the parts. These are your glycosaminoglycans. So the brush-like structures that you saw on the previous schematic diagram are the glycosaminoglycans. Please do appreciate that these glycosaminoglycans are linked to that brown-colored structure. And that brown-colored structure is called the core protein as labeled in the photo. Now, if the glycosaminoglycans are attached to the core protein, you will now refer to them as the proteoglycans. So, proteoglycans are composed of glycosaminoglycans linked to the core protein. So, please take a look at the picture. You have here six proteoglycans. And all of the six proteoglycans are linked together in the center by the green-colored uh, structures we refer to as the linker proteins. And these linker proteins will link the proteoglycan now on the hyaluronic acid, the dark blue colored structure that you can find in the center. Proteoglycans are composed of glycosaminoglycans that are covalently attached to the core proteins. And these proteoglycans are attached to the hyaluronic acid by the linker proteins. It's very important for you guys to memorize the different types of glycosaminoglycans. You have to memorize them by heart. We have the chondroitin sulfate, dermatan sulfate, keratan sulfate, heparan sulfate, and 
the largest among them, the hyaluronic acid. Please take note that all of these glycosaminoglycans are attached to the core protein to form the proteoglycans except for one. The one that you can find in the center, the largest among them. What is that? The hyaluronic acid. Again, all of the glycosaminoglycans are linked to the core protein to form the proteoglycans except for the hyaluronic acid. Take note, hyaluronic acid is the largest among the glycosaminoglycans. Let's apply what you have learned so far. The two red arrows are pointing to the hyaluronic acid and then these two red arrows are pointing to the brush-like structures that we can find in our ground substance and these are the glycosaminoglycans and these glycosaminoglycans are attached to a core protein and they will now form one proteoglycan as mentioned a while ago there are microorganisms that can degrade the ground substance as you can see in this picture, you have here a certain type of bacterium that can produce hyaluronidase. So from the name of the chemical, you will know that it is an enzyme and it is an enzyme that can break down hyaluronic acid. So if this bacterium is introduced into the ground substance of the connective tissue, expect that the bacterium can cause deep-seated infection because the ground substance cannot anymore function to create a barrier to the infection. We have already discussed the polysaccharide component of the ground substance. We have identified them as glycosaminoglycans and proteoglycans. It's now time to discuss the second component of the ground substance and that is the protein. In connective tissue, what is very important to take note is the fibronectin. It's a protein that attaches also cell to another cell or cell to a fiber. You have here in this picture the collagen fiber component of the connective tissue. You also have here the cell membrane of one of the cells in the connective tissue. Please appreciate that the cell is linked to the collagen fiber by this structure labeled as fibronectin. So fibronectin is very much similar to the glycosaminoglycans and proteoglycans. It's just that fibronectin is a protein. We have already discussed the ground substance component of our connective tissue. It's now time to discuss the other components. So let's start with the cell. There could be a lot of cells that we can find in the connective tissue, but there's one that is considered to be the most abundant and the most important. Why do you think this is considered to be the most important cell of the connective tissue? Because it is the cell responsible for the production of the extracellular matrix of the connective tissue, the fiber, and the ground substance component. So therefore, whatever you will see in the connective tissue, they are all from this cell. And this cell is the fibroblast. So what built the connective tissue from scratch is the fibroblast. The other cells that we can find in the connective tissue are the mast cells, the macrophages, the plasma cells, and the neutrophils. And all of these cells are from the bone marrow. So meaning... They don't contribute to the formation of the connective tissue. They will just migrate from the bone marrow and establish themselves in the connective tissue. I want you to think of fibroblasts as this guy in this picture. This guy is planning to build his dream house. The thing is, after he built his house, his relatives from the provinces suddenly traveled towards the city and asked him if they can live with him on his dream house. So the fibroblast will produce the fiber, will deposit the ground substance, but there are cells in the bone marrow that will leave the bone marrow and go to the connective tissue and ask the fibroblast, can we also stay here? Please remember that the fibroblast is the most abundant cell in the connective tissue. So from that idea, I want you to analyze, understand, 
that the cells that have almost the same shapes in the connective tissue are most likely the fibroblast. I hope it's already clear to you now that all of the extracellular matrix components are produced by the fibroblasts and it includes the collagen fiber, elastic fiber, fibers, glycosaminoglycan, proteoglycan, multi-adhesive proteins such as fibronectin, ground substance. Please, I want you to imagine fibroblasts would migrate throughout the connective tissue secreting now the fibers and the ground substance. It's now time to discuss the other cells that can also reside in the connective tissue along with the fibroblast. The other cells in the connective tissue are all produced in the bone marrow. They will leave the bone marrow and migrate towards the connective tissue and establish residence there. One of the cells that we can find in the connective tissue is the neutrophil. So that's the cell shown in the picture along with the red blood cells. Please take note that there are five types of white blood cell. So if you will be asked to count 100 white blood cells on a blood smear, expect that out of the 100, 50 to 70% of them would be neutrophils. So that, that makes neutrophils the most abundant white blood cell. Unlike the typical cell that we can see in the internet or books, the nuclei of neutrophils are not spherical. Instead, they are lobulated. So the nucleus of a neutrophil can have three to five lobes. So please appreciate the nuclei of the two neutrophils in the picture. Can you appreciate that they are lobulated? They have three to four lobes. Since the nuclei of neutrophils are segmented, lobulated, these cells are also referred to as segmenters. And since their nuclei would have many appearance, polymorpho, many appearance, polymorphonuclear. So these cells are also referred to as polymorphonuclears. So we have here four neutrophils. Please appreciate that their nuclei are lobulated. And in this field alone, we can count four neutrophils. So that makes the neutrophil the most abundant white blood cell. The first white blood cell that will go out of the blood vessel and migrate towards the site of infection is the neutrophil. Why? Number one, they are the most abundant white blood cell. Number two, they are the most sensitive to chemotactic stimuli. These chemotactic stimuli are any chemicals released by the microorganisms introduced into the site of infection. Again, the first cell to reach the site of infection is the neutrophil. And how do you think they can provide us with protection against the invading microorganism? Neutrophils are phagocytes. So meaning they will engulf the foreign material and cause them to be digested. And since bacteria are best killed by phagocytosis, so expect that neutrophil count, or we call it as neutrophilia, meaning that uh, the expected neutrophil count is 50 to 70 percent, right? If it goes beyond 70, expect that the high neutrophil count would suggest that there is the presence of bacterial infection. The problem with neutrophils is that one to two days after they were activated, after they will fight for you to keep you alive, these neutrophils will undergo apoptosis program cell death so they will tell you master it was nice serving you you are worth the fight but i have to die now and these neutrophils now will become part of our the past so every time that there is pass on your wound it would only mean that something has died for you so stop dying for the person who doesn't love you back and start living for the cells which are dying to keep you alive.
since neutrophils are only good for one to two days after they are activated by the presence of microorganism and they will become the pus, this neutrophil should be replaced by another phagocyte and that is the monocyte or macrophages. Macrophages are derived from monocytes. Please take note that monocytes and macrophages are produced in the bone marrow. They will emerge out of the bone marrow and go to the blood circulation as monocytes. Some of these monocytes will remain circulating in the blood while some of them will migrate towards the tissues. And you will now refer to them as the macrophage. So therefore, macrophage is the tissue form of monocytes. Monocytes and macrophages are produced in the bone marrow. Once it will go out of the blood, it will be referred to as a monocyte. Once it will migrate towards the tissue and establish residence in there, it will now be called as a macrophage. This is a picture of a monocyte and a neutrophil. Take a look at the neutrophil. You have their three nuclear lobes. Please appreciate that the neutrophils have cytoplasmic granules and these granules are very rich in digestive enzymes. So meaning, every time the neutrophil will engulf bacteria, the bacteria will surely die because of the enzymes present in the granules of the neutrophils. Monocytes and macrophages, on the other hand, are classified as agranulocytes, so they don't have granules in their cytoplasm. Although they may engulf bacteria faster than neutrophils, but the thing is, they lack the cytoplasmic granules which contain enzymes. So their ability to digest microorganisms is not as good as the neutrophil. So the question now is, why replace the neutrophils with something that has a limitation in terms of digesting the engulf or phagocytosed microorganism? So how do you think the monocyte or the macrophage now will be able to help us fight off infection? The answer is, these monocytes and macrophages will act as antigen-presenting cell, meaning they will present the antigen or the microorganism to another cell. And what cell is that? We will discuss that now. So take a look at this portion of the picture. Can you appreciate that this monocyte or macrophage is engulfing a pathogen or a microorganism? Please do appreciate that while inside the cytoplasm of the monocyte and the macrophage, the monocyte or macrophage or the antigen-presenting cell will select the most antigenic or immunogenic portion of that pathogen. Can you appreciate that the pathogen is broken down into pieces? It's because of the activity of the lysosome of the monocyte or macrophage. And what will happen is the most immunogenic or antigenic portion of the pathogen will be displayed on the surface of the macrophage. After the antigen is presented on the surface of the antigen-presenting cell or the monocyte or the macrophage, this antigen now will be presented to T helper cell. In this picture, we have four bacteria. And only one of them was engulfed by the antigen-presenting cell or the monocyte or macrophage. And in the cytoplasm of the antigen-presenting cell, one of the antigens will be loaded on a protein and the antigen and the protein will be displayed on the surface of the antigen-presenting cell. So the next question is, yes, the monocyte and the macrophage in the picture will act as antigen-presenting cell. What will happen to the other three bacteria? Will they not be killed? Let's have another schematic diagram. You have here a microbe that is about to be engulfed by the antigen-presenting cell. While inside the cytoplasm of the antigen-presenting cell, one of the antigens of the microbe will be displayed on the surface of the antigen-presenting cell. 
and the antigen now will be presented to the green colored T helper cell. So what is now the purpose of activating T helper cell? You have here a microbe that was engulfed by the antigen presenting cell and a certain portion of the microbe will be displayed on the surface of the antigen presenting cell or our monocyte or macrophage and as you can see in the picture the monocyte or the macrophage will present the antigen to T helper cell. What is now the role of T helper cell? This T helper cell will activate another cell and that's B cell. And B cell is known to differentiate to form plasma cells. And these plasma cells now are the cells responsible for the production of antibodies. I hope you can remember in this picture that we have four bacteria but only one of them was engulfed by the antigen presenting cell. So what will now cause the death of the other three bacteria? The antibodies produced by the plasma cells because the plasma cells were formed from the B cells, because the B cells were activated by the T helper cells, because the T helper cells were activated by the antigen presenting cell, which engulfed one of the four bacteria. So it only took one of them for the rest to die. So monocytes or macrophages act as antigen presenting cells and they will present the antigen to T helper. T helper in return will activate B cells so that B cells will differentiate to form the plasma cells and produce antibodies. Do you know that the different macrophages in the different tissues or organs in the body have their own corresponding names? So I will be naming them for you guys. In the connective tissue, we call them as histiocytes. In the liver, we call them as Kaffer cells. In the lungs, we call them as alveolar macrophages or dust cells, D-U-S-T, dust cells. In the bone, we call them osteoclast. In the glomerulus of the kidney, we call them as mesangial cells. In the CNS, we call them as the microglial cells. Most students would confuse, no, I would be confused between mesangial and and microglial cells. So for you to easily remember that mesangial is found in the glomerulus. I want you to pronounce glomerulus that way. Glomerulus mesangial cells. In the skin, we call them as longer hands. In the lymph nodes, we call them as follicular dendritic cells. So these are the names of the different macrophages in the different tissues or organs in the body. If I memorize them, you should also memorize them. Aside from neutrophils, aside from macrophages, we can also find plasma cells in our connective tissue. And as you have learned a while ago, plasma cells are the activated form of B cells and they are capable of producing antibodies. Plasma cells are derived from B cells. If these B cells are activated, they can now form the plasma cells and plasma cells will produce antibodies. The next question is, how can we identify now if the cell we're looking at is the plasma cell? Please take note of its characteristic eccentric nucleus. When you say eccentric nucleus, the nucleus is not situated in the center just like most of the cells in the body. The nucleus is displaced at the periphery. Another unique characteristic of the nucleus of plasma cell is that the nucleus appears to have a clock face appearance. So, refer to the photo on the right side of the screen. That's a higher magnification view of one of the nucleus of the plasma cells in the body. And please appreciate that it has dark staining areas, heterochromatin, and light staining areas, euchromatin. And this hetero and euchromatin are alternately arranged. That's why, as you can see in the picture, the areas labeled with numbers 3, 6, 9, and 12 are heterochromatin. Between them, you have light staining areas which represent the euchromatin. That's why the nucleus of a plasma cell would have a clock face appearance aside from the fact that it is eccentrically 
located. The next cell that we will discuss is the mast cell. Before I will give you the information about mast cell, it's very important to review that macrophages are the tissue forms of monocytes. They are both produced in the bone marrow. They leave the bone marrow as monocytes. If it will keep on circulating in the blood, it will still remain as a monocyte. But once it will migrate towards the tissue and establish residence in there, then the monocyte will transform into a macrophage. In old literatures and references, they would always describe mass cells as the tissue forms of basophils. So they were saying that mass cells were originally basophils. It's just that these basophils migrated towards the tissue. In latest researches and studies, they have found out that mass cells are different from basophils, although they contain the same chemicals in their granules. What chemical am I talking about? We will know later. This is the picture of a basophil, one of our white blood cells. Take note of the dark blue granules. These dark blue granules contain histamine. Take note, basophils leave the bone marrow mature. That's why they will spend most of their lifespan circulating in the blood. The main cell that we will discuss, the mast cell, will leave the bone marrow immature and will only become mature once it will reside in the tissue. This is the picture of mast cells. Can you appreciate that they also have dark blue granules similar to the basophils? That's the very reason why in old books, old references, they are referred to as the tissue forms of basophils. But again, I would like to emphasize that latest studies have shown that they are completely different cells from basophils. Now, the dark blue granules in the cytoplasm of mast cells also contain histamine. And we always associate histamine with common allergies. This is a picture of a connective tissue. Please appreciate the presence of cells with dark blue granules in their cytoplasm. So these cells are the mast cells. At this point, we will be discussing the pathophysiology behind the common allergies such as allergic rhinitis and bronchial asthma. So I want you to take a look at the allergen in the picture. If this allergen will enter the body or let's say the, the epithelium of the airways, the allergen will be engulfed by antigen-presenting cells as shown in the picture. And since these are antigen-presenting cells, expect that they will present the antigen to T-cell, particularly a T-helper type of T-cell. And do you know what will happen? This T-helper cell will activate B-cell. And B-cell will differentiate to form plasma cells. But in the case of allergens, the antibody that is produced is IgE. Please don't forget this one. The antibody produced against allergen is IgE. And I want you to take a look at the red rectangle. It is shown there that as soon as IgEs are already available, they will display themselves using their tail portion, the tail portion of the Y-shaped antibody. You call the tail portion as FC. F, capital F, small letter C. The FC portion or tail portion of IgEs will bind to the receptors present on the surface of mass cells as shown in the picture. So let's have a review. You have here the presence of allergens and then the allergen will be taken up by the antigen-presenting cell, the orange colored cell in the picture. And the antigen-presenting cell will present the antigen to T helper 2. And the T helper 2 will activate B cell. 
B cell will become plasma cells and the plasma cells will produce the brown colored letter Y shaped IgEs. And what do you notice? These IgEs now will start displaying themselves on the surface of the yellow colored basophil or mast cell. I want everybody to understand before the mast cell or the basophil will be activated to release the histamine in their granules, there must be what we call cross-linking. So I want you to refer to the red rectangle in the picture. When you say cross-linking, one, allergen, I think it's colored orange or brown in the picture, should bind two green colored IgEs at the same time. So that's what we mean by cross-linking. One allergen will cross-link two IgEs at the same time. It is only when cross-linking will happen that the mast cell now will degranulate to release histamine. Why is it important to take note of the cross-linking? Let's apply that one on the discussions of the succeeding slides. You know very well that during the first exposure, our body will just produce IgEs against the allergen. And the IgEs produced will be displayed on the surface of the blue-colored mast cell in the picture. Please appreciate the presence of the granules containing the histamine. At this point, since there is no cross-linking, the histamine will not be released from the mast cell and basophil. This is the very reason why you will notice that, uh, let's say for example, you are allergic to dust. You can still recall that when you were younger, you used to play around your house. You get to be exposed to dust and yet you are not developing allergic rhinitis or asthma against the dust. But today, with your age, even if you will just clean your room, what will happen is a second of exposure to dust will now trigger you to develop allergic rhinitis. The main reason behind it is that Today, there is already cross-linking. When you were younger, there is still no cross-linking because you are still accumulating the, the IgEs on the surface of your mast cell. So for you to understand what I'm talking about, I want you to imagine that you have been exposed to dust already. The second time that you will encounter the same dust particle, and if the allergen in the dust particle will bind to the IgE, the reaction of the mast cell and basophil to the binding of, I, of the allergen to the IgE will depend if there is already cross-linking or not. In this case, cross-linking is still not possible. But if you will be exposed for several times to the same type of allergen, expect that the number of IgE antibodies on the surface of the mast cell will also increase. That's why the next time that you will be exposed to the same allergen, cross-linking will happen and it will now cause the muscles to degranulate and release the histamine molecules. So as you can see in this picture, there is cross-linking which will trigger the mast cell and basophil to release the histamine. And histamine would have different effects on the different organs in the body. And we will discuss them on the next slide. Histamine can act on the smooth muscles of the respiratory tract, causing them to contract and cause bronchoconstriction, just like what you see in people with asthma. And that's the major reason why they are having difficulty of breathing. This histamine can also act on the smooth muscles of the blood vessels, causing them to relax. So if the smooth muscles in the airway will contract, the smooth muscles in the blood vessels in response to histamine will relax, causing now the blood vessel to dilate. And I want you all to imagine if the blood vessel will dilate, it will cause the blood pressure to go down. That's why the problem with this type of allergic reaction is that if the release of histamine is massive and this histamine now will act on the different blood vessels in the body causing them to dilate, then it will really cause hypotension.
hypertension. Aside from that, these blood vessels in response to histamine will have higher or increased permeability, allowing now the escape of fluids. So just try to imagine the vasodilation has already caused hypotension, plus you will allow some of the fluids in the blood to leak out of the blood vessel, and that will now cause worsening of the hypotension. And what will happen? The patient will no longer be able to supply his or her organs with enough blood and oxygen, and you will call that state as shock. Histamine can also act on the mucous glands, increasing their secretion. That's why in people who are having allergic rhinitis, they would always complain of increased nasal secretions. And histamine can also act on the nerves, and that will be interpreted by the brain as the pruritus. So this is the summary of the pathophysiology of the common allergies. On the first exposure, expect that the body will just develop IgE antibodies against the allergen and these IgE antibodies will be displayed on the surface of mast cells and basophils. There is no release of histamine yet at this point. Histamine will only be released on the re-exposure because there would be possibility of what? Cross-linking. Cross-linking would involve one allergen binding two IgEs at the same time. If cross-linking will happen, the histamine and the basophil now will release the histamine, causing now the different clinical manifestations of common allergies. So we're done with the first two components of the connective tissue. We have already discussed the different cells. We have highlighted that the fibroblast is the most abundant and most important among them, while the rest of the cells are from the bone marrow and they will just reside in the connective tissue. We have also discussed the ground substance. So it's now time to discuss the third component of our connective tissue and that is the fiber. There are three basic types of fibers. We have collagen, reticular, and elastic fiber. If the organ has to be tough and strong, then the best fiber that should be present in it is collagen. If the organ is soft and contains a lot of cells, the best fiber to support cells is reticular fiber. If the organ is always subjected to bending, stretching, and they must go back to their original size after being stretched, then the best fiber that should be present in it is elastic fiber. Elastic fibers are present in organs that are always subjected to bending and stretching. And it includes the following, the skin, the lungs, the aorta in its direct branches, and the pulmonary artery. The lungs must be provided with elastic fiber so that the lungs can expand whenever we inhale air and must be able to go back to its original size after exhalation. This is the picture of the heart. This is its atrium. This is its ventricle. Please appreciate in the picture that the ventricle is more muscular than the atrium. So expect that the ventricle would generate a more powerful and a more forceful contraction than that of the atrium. So the blood vessels that should receive the blood coming from the ventricle should accommodate the force and the large volume of blood. So these blood vessels should dilate, should stretch beyond their original size. So what are these blood vessels? You have here the pulmonary artery, which receives the blood coming from the right ventricle. And you have here the aorta, which receives the blood coming from the left ventricle. The blue arrow is pointing to the pulmonary artery. Can you appreciate that the pulmonary artery is stretching beyond its original size to accommodate the blood coming from the right ventricle? So expect that the pulmonary artery and the aorta should be provided with abundant elastic fibers. This is the cut section of the aorta. You can see in the center its lumen. What we will do is we will take a look at its wall under the microscope. Let's view the wall of the aorta at a higher magnification. And this is how it will look like. Can you appreciate on the area labeled with number 2, you have their thin fibers, 
those are actually elastic fibers. And these are the fibers responsible for allowing the aorta to stretch beyond its original size every time that the ventricle will contract. And these are elastic fibers. If the organ needs to be rigid, tough, and strong, then the best fiber that should be present in abundance in that organ is collagen. Just like in the case of elastic fiber, collagen is also synthesized by the fibroblasts of the connective tissue. Expect to find this fiber in organs that are what again? Strong, rigid, and tough. One of the structures in the body that contains abundant collagen fiber is the tendon. The tendon functions to connect the muscles to the bone. And I want you to imagine muscles contract when they do they shorten so what will happen they will pull the tendon to cause the bone to move as well but the thing is the tendon must withstand the pulling force of the muscle and for the tendon to do that the tendon must have abundant collagen fibers which will make it tough and strong so Take a look at the picture of the tendon on the right side of the screen. Can you appreciate that it has the presence of numerous collagen fibers? Let's try to take a look at the tendon under the microscope and this is how it will look like. Please appreciate the pink colored collagen fibers. In between the fibers, you have there the fibroblasts which are responsible for their production. Of the three components of the connective tissue, the fiber, the cell, and the ground substance, it's very obvious that in the case of the tendon, the fibers predominate over the cells and the ground substance. If that's the case, the tissue will be identified, classified as dense connective tissue. I want you to take a look at the arrangement of the collagen fibers. They are all arranged in a single direction. Why? Because every time the muscle will pull the tendon, the collagen fibers must be able to withstand the pulling by being arranged in a single direction. So, since the fibers are arranged in a single direction, you will refer to this tissue as dense regular. When you say regular, it means the collagen fibers are arranged in single direction. Dense regular connective tissue. The next structure in the body that has abundant collagen fibers is the ligament. And ligament functions to link bones together. So if the tendon will attach the muscle to the bone, what will attach one bone to the other bone is the ligament. So take a look at the ligament in the picture. This is how the ligament will look like under the microscope. Please appreciate that there's also the predominance of collagen fibers because you basically need collagen fibers in the ligament so that the bones will not separate. And appreciate that the collagen fibers are also arranged in a single direction. So ligament is also an example of a dense regular connective tissue. Another structure that has a dense regular connective tissue is the aponeurosis. And the aponeurosis functions to connect muscle to another muscle. If it is muscle to a bone, it's tendon. If it is bone to bone, it's called ligament. If it is a muscle to another muscle, you call it as aponeurosis. So in this case, the aponeurosis in this photo is attaching the occipitalis to the frontalis muscle. So every time these muscles will contract, they will be pulling the aponeurosis forward and backward. So, expect that the collagen fibers will be arranged in a single direction as well. And for the aponeurosis to be strong, you must have abundant collagen fibers in there. So, therefore, aponeurosis is also a dense, regular, connective tissue. So, what have we learned so far? We have mentioned three structures in the body that contain abundant collagen fibers because they are supposed to be rigid and tough. And we have learned that they have collagen fibers arranged in a single direction. That's why we refer to the tendon, the ligaments, and the aponeurosis as dense, regular connective tissue. The brain and the spinal cord are protected by bones and meninges. 
One of the layers of the meninges of the brain and spinal cord is dura mater. That's the structure that is held by the hand and the forcep in the photos. This dura mater is a tough tissue or a tough layer of the meninges. So expect that you should find there abundant collagen fibers because it's supposed to protect the brain. So it has to be tough. The thing is, the dura mater must protect the brain from multiple directions because force and trauma can come from any direction. So, aside from having abundant collagen fibers, the collagen fibers in the dura mater must be arranged in multiple directions so that the dura mater can protect the brain from any direction. So, if we're going to sample the dura mater and view it under the microscope, this is how it will look like. You have there the abundance of collagen fibers, but these collagen fibers are irregularly arranged. That's why dura mater is classified as dense, irregular, connective tissue. Organs in the body are covered by a capsule. So take a look at the picture of the kidney and appreciate that it is covered by renal capsule. The liver is also covered by a capsule and it has a special name, Gleason's capsule. The main purpose of these capsules is to provide protection to the organs. The capsule of the kidney has to protect the kidney from multiple directions because force and trauma can come from any direction. So expect that this capsule of the kidney and the capsule of the other organs in the body should be composed of abundant collagen fibers and the collagen fibers must be irregularly arranged. So therefore, the capsules of the different organs in the body are classified as dense, irregular, connective tissue. Another organ that contains dense, irregular, connective tissue is the skin. The skin has two layers, the epidermis, or the one equivalent to its stratified squamous keratinized epithelium, and the underlying connective tissue, which is called the dermis. The dermis has two layers, the superficial papillary and the deep reticular layer. I want you to take a look at the reticular layer. Can you appreciate there the abundance of collagen fibers? And these collagen fibers are irregularly arranged. Therefore, the reticular layer of the dermis has dense, irregular, connective tissue. So that if your ex-girlfriend will slap you because she caught you cheating, your skin will be able to maintain its integrity because of the dense, irregular connective tissue present on the reticular dermis. Another structure that has dense, irregular connective tissue is the tunica albuginea. And this is the outer covering of the testes of males. This is the picture of one of the testes and shown here that it is covered with tunica albuginea. This tunica albuginea should provide protection to the testes from multiple directions. Why? I know by showing you this picture, you have already understood why the testis has to be protected by a dense irregular connective tissue that will protect it from multiple directions. There are organs that do not need to be tough and strong. There are organs that do not need to stretch beyond their original size. What makes this group of organs unique from the organs that we have already mentioned a while ago is that they contain a lot of cells. And group of cells are best supported by our third fiber, and that is the reticular fiber. So take a look at the picture of the liver and the bone marrow. Can you appreciate that they contain a lot of cells? So these organs must be rich or abundant in reticular fibers. So I came up with the mnemonics bell paths for you to easily memorize what organs in the body are rich in reticular fibers because they contain a lot of cells. Bell paths, bone marrow, endocrine glands, lymph nodes, liver, pancreas, thymus, and spleen. So please pause this part of the video 
and memorize first the organs that contain abundant reticular fibers before you proceed to the discussion. The most commonly used stain in histology laboratory or histopath laboratory is hematoxylin and eosin. But this stain cannot demonstrate the presence of reticular fibers. That's why in this cut section of the liver, you only see in their cells, but you don't see fibers around them. Because reticular fibers are not easily stained by HNE. And the only stain that can make us appreciate that there are fibers in there is just that they were not stained by HNE is silver stain. And silver stain will make the reticular fibers appear black in color. So, take a look at the blue arrow. That's the central vein. That is our point of reference in identifying that we're looking at the cut section of the liver. This is how the liver will appear under silver staining. Please refer to the central vein pointed by the blue arrow. Take a look at the cells. Can you appreciate that the cells are surrounded by black colored fibers? So these black colored fibers now are the reticular fibers. These are the cells of the bone marrow and this bone marrow specimen was stained by HNE. As you can see, you cannot see there the presence of reticular fibers, but you can always assume that they are there. It's just that they are not stained by HNE. So I want you to take a look at this large cell pointed by the blue arrow. That is the megakaryocyte. So that we will use the megakaryocyte as a point of reference. This is how the bone marrow would appear under silver staining. Take a look at the blue arrow that is pointing to one of the megakaryocytes. Please appreciate the appearance of the black-colored hair-like structures. So those are now the reticular fibers. Reticular fibers are best demonstrated by using silver stain. And they would appear to have what color? Black color. And they are present in bell pads, bone marrow, endocrine, lymph nodes, liver, pancreas, thymus, and spleen. We can classify connective tissues into two groups. We have embryonic, which is basically present during the embryonic stage of life, and the mature. In terms of the embryonic connective tissue, we have two types. We have the mesenchyme and the mucous connective tissue. Before I will discuss the different types of embryonic connective tissue, Please be reminded that we have three components of the connective tissue. We have the cells, the ground substance, and the fiber. In the case of embryonic connective tissue, the ground substance predominates over the cell and the fiber component. So expect that whenever you look at the embryonic connective tissue, you should expect to find large areas filled up with ground substances. Mesenchyme is one of the embryonic connective tissues and as mentioned on the previous slide, you should see that the ground substance will predominate over the other two components of the connective tissue. So that's why in the picture you can see large spaces occupied by the ground substance. Please appreciate that the irregularly shaped cells in there are called the mesenchymal cells. Do you know that these mesenchymal cells can give rise to the other cells that we can find in the adult connective tissue? And we will discuss them later on. Now, these mesenchymal cells are supported by reticular fibers. Please take note that the mesenchymal cells of the mesenchyme can give rise to the cells of the adult connective tissue or the mature connective tissue. So these mesenchymal cells can give rise to the chondrocytes of the cartilage, the osteoblasts of the bone, the myocytes of the muscle, and the adipocytes of the adipose tissue, plus the fibroblasts of the mature connective tissue. The mesenchyme is predominated by ground substance, plus the fact that the cells are supported by reticular fibers. And these characteristics will give the mesenchyme the loose, fluid nature. 
With that, it's easy for the mesenchymal cells to migrate from certain areas of the embryo to other areas so that these mesenchymal cells can give rise to the mature cells of the connective tissue. They can form chondrocytes to form cartilage in one area of the body. They can become the osteoblasts and form bones in certain areas in the body. They can become the, the myocytes and form muscles in different areas in the body. So in summary, the mesenchyme is composed of predominating ground substance plus mesenchymal cells and these mesenchymal cells are supported by reticular fibers. The other type of embryonic connective tissue is the mucous connective tissue. Just like in the case of mesenchyme, what will predominate in the mucous connective tissue is the ground substance. Now, what is the difference between the mucous type of embryonic connective tissue and the mesenchyme. Mucous connective tissue, just like the mesenchyme, is predominated by ground substance. But instead of mesenchymal cells and reticular fibers, this mucous connective tissue contains fibroblasts which will specialize in producing collagen fibers. So expect that the mucous connective tissue will be harder than that of the mesenchyme because the mucous connective tissue functions to provide support in a structure that we can find in a developing embryo and that is the Wharton's jelly of the umbilical cord. The umbilical cord connects the fetal circulation to the placenta then to the maternal circulation. So this umbilical cord helps the baby get nutrients and oxygen from his or her mother. What we will do at this point is to cut the umbilical cord. If you cut the umbilical cord, you will notice that it has three blood vessels. You have two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein. As we separate the baby from the placenta, it's very important to clamp the umbilical cord. Why? That is to prevent the baby from bleeding. Now, take a look at the two umbilical arteries and umbilical vein. They are surrounded now by the Wharton's jelly of the umbilical cord. And the purpose of that Wharton's jelly is to provide support to these three blood vessels. Do you know, I just read from one article or literature that once this Wharton's jelly is exposed to cold temperature, especially if the child is already delivered, the Wharton's jelly will solidify. So therefore, it will what? Impinge the blood vessels, compress the blood vessels, thereby it can also help in the prevention of blood loss. So let's try to prepare a thin section of the umbilical cord and look at it under the microscope. And this is how it will look like. As you can see, you have there two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein. This is another cut section of the umbilical cord. As you can see, you have here two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein. And then I want you to take a look at this area of the Wharton's jelly. Can you appreciate that that area has large spaces? Those large spaces now are occupied by ground substance because ground substance predominates in the embryonic type of connective tissue. So this is how the Wharton's jelly will look like under the microscope. As you can see, it has large spaces occupied by the ground substance. But the cells and the fibers present in mucous connective tissue are not mesenchymal and reticular. They are what? Fibroblasts and collagen fibers which are suited for providing support. So in summary, ground substance predominates in the mucous connective tissue and it is composed of fibroblasts and collagen fibers. We have already finished discussing the embryonic connective tissue 
it's now time to discuss the mature connective tissue. In terms of mature connective tissue, we have two types. We have the loose connective tissue and the dense connective tissue. These are two mature connective tissues. The picture on the right is showing you a dense connective tissue. The basis for naming a connective tissue as dense is the number of fibers. If the fibers will predominate in the connective tissue, you will refer to the connective tissue as dense connective tissue. But if it is the cell and the ground substance that will predominate over the fiber, you will refer to the connective tissue as loose. And that's the one that is shown on the left side of the screen. So, in a dense connective tissue, the fiber will always predominate over the other two components. While in the loose connective tissue, the cell and the ground substance will predominate over the fiber. Loose connective tissue has three types. Before I will identify them, please always bear in mind that in loose connective tissue, what will predominate are the cells and the ground substance. And you expect to find few fibers unlike with dense connective tissue. Now, the three types of loose connective tissue are the following. We have the areolar, reticular, and the adipose tissue. In terms of the areolar connective tissue, the three components are almost of the same ratio. In areolar connective tissue, fibers, ground substance, and cells are roughly in equal parts. And this type of loose connective tissue is found in the following. It is found immediately underneath the epithelium. It is found in the lamina propria of the digestive tract. And it can be found in areas where you have blood vessels and nerves. So this connective tissue surrounds blood vessels and nerves. This is a good picture of areolar connective tissue. As you can see, the three components are in roughly equal parts. This is another picture of areolar connective tissue. As you can see, none of the components will predominate over the other. This is the picture of the skin. As you can see, it is lined by stratified squamous keratinized epithelium. And then you have learned a while ago that the deeper layer of the dermis is called the reticular dermis. And it is primarily composed of dense irregular connective tissue because as you can see in the picture you have there abundant collagen fibers and they are arranged in multiple directions but i want you to focus at the papillary dermis that's the layer of the dermis immediately below the epithelium and as mentioned a while ago areolar connective tissue is found beneath the epithelium so take a look at the papillary dermis. Compared to reticular dermis, it has lesser fibers. So therefore, that papillary dermis is a loose connective tissue. What particular type? Areolar. This is a picture of the skin. The red arrow is pointing to the reticular dermis and that is composed of dense irregular connective tissue. And then this brown arrow is pointing at the papillary layer of the dermis, the portion of the dermis that is beneath the epithelium. And as you can see, it has lesser fiber component compared to the reticular dermis. So therefore, the papillary dermis is composed of areolar connective tissue. In the organs of the gastrointestinal tract, there are two connective tissues. One is found along the mucosa. So please appreciate that the mucosa has three layers. The innermost layer, the one that comes in contact with the food, is the epithelium. The epithelium is supported by that yellow colored area that's a connective tissue and we call that as the lamina propria 
and surrounding the lamina propria is the muscularis mucosae. But at this point, I will not be requiring you to memorize the layers of the mucosa. What I want you to understand is the lamina propria. Next, do you know that this mucosa is supported by a larger connective tissue and that is the submucosa. So there are two connective tissues in the GIT organs, lamina propria, which is part of the mucosa, and the bigger submucosa. Please take note that the lamina propria is composed of areolar connective tissue while the submucosa is composed of dense irregular connective tissue. Let's apply that one on this picture. This blue arrow is pointing to the mucosa. Please appreciate the epithelium that is found nearest to the lumen. Then, the epithelium is supported by the lamina propria, the layer at the tip of the blue arrow. That lamina propria is composed of loose connective tissue, particularly areolar type. And then, as you can see in the picture, the lamina propria is surrounded by the muscularis mucosae. And then, this second blue arrow is pointing to the bigger connective tissue and that is the submucosa and this submucosa is composed of dense irregular connective tissue i will use this picture to prove to you that the lamina propria of the git organs is composed of areolar connective tissue the small intestine is known to have finger-like projections we call the villi the red arrow is pointing to one velus right now. The red arrow is pointing at the epithelium of the mucosa of the small intestine. And you have learned a while ago that immediately below the lining epithelium, you have the lamina propria. And that lamina propria is composed of areolar connective tissue. These are the finger-like projections we call the villi. This red arrow right now is pointing to the lining epithelium of the mucosa of the intestine. And this second red arrow is pointing to its lamina propria. What do you notice? The area pointed by the red arrow right now is an example of a loose connective tissue, particularly areolar connective tissue. The second type of loose connective tissue is the reticular connective tissue. Again, since this is a loose connective tissue, expect to find less fiber components compared to the dense connective tissue. In the case of reticular connective tissue, the cells will predominate over the other two components. And I hope you can remember in our discussion that if an organ contains a lot of cells, the best fiber that would support that organ is reticular fiber. So that's basically the reason why this type of connective tissue is named reticular connective tissue because the fiber present in this group of tissues or organs is reticular fiber. So I will no longer read the content of this PowerPoint slide. I just want you all to recall the mnemonics bell pads. Bell pads contain reticular fibers. So they are considered to have reticular connective tissue. Take a look at this reticular connective tissue. Can you appreciate that among the three components, it is the cell that predominates over the other two? And then, I hope you can remember that the stain that we should use to demonstrate reticular fiber is silver. And silver will impart black color to the reticular fibers. So therefore, those black hair-like structures that you can see in the picture are the reticular fibers. This is again another picture of the reticular connective tissue. As you can see, you have here abundant cellular component and they are supported by those black colored reticular fibers. The third type of loose connective tissue is the adipose tissue. And I want you to take a look at the sample picture of the adipose tissue. It is primarily composed of fat cells and we call them as the 
adipose cells and these adipose cells are surrounded by loose connective tissue and how will you know if the cells you're looking at are adipose cells these cells basically look like that of a signet ring doc what do you mean by that adipose cells are known to store fats every time you eat fats and if you have excess of them in your body they will be stored in the adipose cells through time the fats will accumulate they will enlarge in size and they will cause the nucleus and other organelles to be displaced in the periphery thereby causing these cells to appear like that of a signet ring so just like in the case of plasma cells the nuclei of adipose cells are also eccentrically located. This is another picture of the adipose tissue. As you can see, you have here multiple adipocytes or fat cells. And please appreciate the signet ring-like appearance. The second type of mature connective tissue is the dense connective tissue. And what makes it dense is the presence of abundant fibers there are three types of dense connective tissue we have the elastic connective tissue we have the dense irregular and the dense regular connective tissue a good example of elastic connective tissue is the aorta let's try to take a look at the aorta under the microscope let's try to view it on a higher magnification and this is what you will see. As you can see, you have here abundant elastic fibers. So that makes the aorta an example of a dense connective tissue. But we have to be specific what type of fiber is present in the organ we're looking at. And since we can identify that these thin fibers here are elastic fibers, we will name this tissue as elastic connective tissue one of the types of dense connective tissue the second type is the dense regular connective tissue and i know you have already memorized the examples of dense regular connective tissue expect that there is the abundance of collagen fibers and the collagen fibers are arranged on a single direction and that's how we described the collagen fibers in the tendon, the aponeurosis, and the ligaments. What we will use or discuss as an example for dense regular connective tissue is the corneal stroma. Please always remember that the tendon, the ligament, and the aponeurosis, it's because among the three components of the connective tissue, what will predominate in the tendon, ligament, and aponeurosis is the collagen fiber component. And the collagen fibers are all arranged in a single direction. Please do appreciate the presence of fibroblasts, which are the ones responsible for the production of these collagen fibers. Another example of a structure that contains dense regular connective tissue is the stroma of the cornea. So the cornea protects the anterior portion of the eye. So it has to be tough. It has to be strong. So therefore, you have to put in there abundant collagen fibers. So highlighted in the picture is the histology of the cornea. And then at the tip of the arrow, you have there the middle layer of the cornea. We call it as the stroma. And this stroma contains abundant collagen fibers. There are five layers to the cornea, but I only want to highlight number three. Can you appreciate number three has abundant collagen fibers? So that makes the cornea an example of a dense connective tissue. Looking at the collagen fibers, you can appreciate that they are arranged in single direction. So the stroma of the cornea is an example of a dense regular connective tissue. We have also previously discussed dense irregular connective tissue. I even gave you examples. So let's just have a review. 
This is referred to as dense because you have there the presence of abundant collagen fibers. This is named irregular because the collagen fibers are running in different directions or they have different orientation. Then, these are the sample organs or structures in the body that contain dense irregular connective tissue. The reticular dermis of the skin, you have the capsules of the organ, the covering of the testis, the tunica albuginea, the dura matter of the brain, and the bigger connective tissue present in the GIT, and that's the submucosa. The first blue arrow is pointing to the areolar connective tissue layer of the GIT. That's the lamina propria. And this is the submucosa. This one contains dense, irregular connective tissue. Please don't forget that one. Mucosis are composed of dense, regular connective tissue. This is a good picture of dense, irregular connective tissue. As you can see, the fibers predominate over the ground substance in the cells and the fibers are running in different directions or oriented in different directions. This is also another picture of dense, regular connective tissue. And that ends my lecture on connective tissue. Thank you very much for listening.